Hello. Hello, it's Tony. Oh, good to see the team. Welcome, everyone. Thank you in advance, Susan and Bryant. Oh, Tony, what a beautiful day here. It is. 79 degrees, I was just reading. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm in my cold basement. Your cold basement. You got to show me. Show me your cold basement. I'm just turning it on now. There you are. I descended into my cold basement twice to do laundry. I, the laundry stuff is down there. And it's, a, it's remarkable how much colder it is down there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we also have air. So it's also the air conditioning's cooling it off down here too. So it, it gets kind of chilly. Yeah, no. It, <laughs> well, you probably can't stay down there to, all day then, can you? you, you get no, it's cold. pretty hard. <laughs> By the end of this, I'll be shaking. You won't be able to see me clearly. <laughs> Do you go down there for peace and quiet, though? Oh, yeah. There, I, I, this is also where my music room is, so I play guitar quite often down here. This is mm -hmm. also my home office, so I'm down here a lot of the day anyway. Have you been playing guitar for a long time? Yes. Um, over 20 years, I think. Wow. Of, by this point. Are you, like, in, a, in any local bands? No, I haven't played out in uh, quite a few years. I don't know how people can do it. I'm too busy. I don't know where they find the time. I don't either. I don't have any. The only hobbies I have are things that like help the house to function. You know, I am. I have um, gardening or you know home repair, I and mean, I consider them hobbies at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, you do enough gardening, it, it's your hobby. <laughs> it's right. not a chore anymore. It's a hobby. Yeah. Oh, I can see some people who've been here before. Dr. Hunt is here again. And uh, Steve Camp, Chair of Material Science and Engineering. Welcome, Steve. 15 minutes early. Yeah, no, people chime in early. Yeah, so um, you guys know you can communicate with us by sending us a Q&A. And even if it's not a question, you can actually just say hello that way if you want to. <laughs> It's kind of a handy, handy way to communicate. So, um, yeah, I know. Um, when, should I, when should I make the, the slides live or share my screen? I think I wait a little while because um, okay. it's usually just kind of conversation. So maybe at five, at five of is probably a good time frame. Okay. Yeah, so um, beautiful day. We had, it, you know, I moved here from Boise, Idaho two years ago and Boise is, um, what they call high desert. It's, it's elevations about 35, 4,000 4, feet. And, um, or actually I think it's 3,700 uh, in my, um, and it doesn't rain very much there. You know, we used to get about 10 inches of rainfall per year. And here in Houghton, we're more like 50, you know? So it's, it's like, you basically don't need to water things here. You can just wait for the rain to come and Unless it's in a pot, you know, you know, you don't have to kind of run out and water everything on a day. It, and it's still mind blowing to me because, you know, water was practically rationed in in, uh, in uh, Boise. We 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 did it. We did have enough water because it, it's all snow melt off the mountains that are, you know the Idaho oh. mountains. So it's not like we're waiting for a river to flow through us. But um, there. But uh, no, it's it's remarkable how much fresh water there is here. What, a, what an enormous asset. And the clean air, that was the other issue with Boise was that um, there would always be a fire somewhere in the West and that the fire just kind of like the smoke just diffuses all over that part of the US. And it's just not very healthy to breathe smoky air all the time. Yeah, and what was the snowfall like there? Snowfall up in the mountains, it would, they would, it would really accumulate. I mean, you'd get a really, I don't know how many feet, 20 feet, I don't know, just a ridiculous amount of snow up in the mountains uh, and excellent skiing, of course, but and big elevations, right? So, you, you know, my husband used to backcountry ski there. And that's, that's the, it's a really crazy sport where you, where you, um, you have special skis that have like high heels. It's kind of like a strange kind of ski. And you could, you walk sideways up the mountain, then you turn your leg around it, it's this elaborate procedure, which I could never do. And then you walk up another more, and then you turn around and you go and you walk your way to the top of the mountain. And then you spend five minutes skiing down. And then you repeat the process until you're exhausted. <laughs> Is that Nordic skiing? 
they call it backcountry skiing and they do it because they want snow that other people haven't ever skied on before. They want to have powder. I see. Hmm. So, you know, and the, if, if you're less, less of a purist, I guess you can get yourself dropped off by a helicopter at the top of a mountain and, and accomplish the same thing for a lot less calories. <laughs> that was more expensive. Yeah, I know. So do you have winter hobbies? Oh yeah. So, well, recently we haven't done much snowboarding or skiing, downhill skiing anyway. Um, but we have done a lot of cross country with the kids. Mm -hmm. So um, does that mean you're dragging them in a sled or they're actually skiing? Dragging them in a sled. <laughs> I'm hoping maybe this winter, our oldest, which will be four this winter, he'll be able to go on his own a little bit, but it's mostly just a trailer that attaches to your hips yeah. and you kind of pull behind you. So it's your job to pull the kids or do you each pull a kid? My wife gets both because I can't do it. <laughs> I'm not a skier. I'm not a good skier. So I'll just fall over. She's really good. She's been doing it her whole life. No, that takes a lot of strength, like serious strength. It is, but she's into that too. Well, so. and what do you do when it's a, it's a downhill thing? What do you, what do you do? Do you kind of like let, let the kids go first and slow them down from behind? Um, she's able to break somehow enough to That's prevent crazy. it. I don't know. <laughs> I can cross country ski, except when it's downhill. Cause you know, I just can't snow plow in cross country skis. It doesn't work at all. The, um, they're not stiff enough to let you dig in. And I do not like the concept of falling anymore. I just, the whole idea of falling, it's just not. <laughs> so <laughs> my husband is a much better skier than me. And, and, uh, you know, I just take my skis off and start walking down the hills, <laughs> kind of like my method. <laughs> so. You have to strap a, a sled to your back or something. Well, I don't know. The whole breaking. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when he does, when those backcountry skiers there, they've got some sort of special skins on the, that sort of stick to the bottom of their skis. And that's how they have the traction to be able to kind of march up the hill like that. And this is the, this is the crux move. Like if you do this, backcountry skiing and now you're at the top of a powder hill and you're going to ski, ski down you you stand on one foot and you raise like one leg in the air far off the ground so your ski can clear it you reach up and you pull the um skin off and keep your balance on one leg at the same time you're pulling and pulling and then you roll it up and put it away and then you do your other leg <laughs> i went back tree skiing once <laughs> that was it for me oh. No more is of that, that the one? So, is your ankle attached, or your, the back of your heel? Is it attached to the the ski, or is it able to lift? It lifts, and then I, I think you lock it in when you ski down the hill. But it, oh, it, I see. it, it, you end up with kind of somehow that little bit of lift at the heel helps you get up the hill. I see. Yeah, after that one time, we just sold my skis, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Because the other horrible thing about backcountry skiing is if you fall, you've now fallen in powder, right? And standing up in powder is almost impossible. It's like trying to get back to your feet, almost right. impossible. You know, standing up on snow, in snow when you've fallen down wearing skis is one thing, but first, because you can't stand up without the skis on because you sink to the bottom of this, you know, all this powder. Right. You have to be able to stand up with your skis on somehow. And, yeah. Yep. No. Hmm. What I really needed to get down that hill was snowshoes. <laughs> That's what I needed. No problem there. Yeah, so hobbies for you, guitar playing for many, many years. What kind of music do you like to play? Um, all kinds. It, it started, uh, I had like a metal phase for a while, heavy metal phase, but I kind of drifted away from that. I think everybody goes through that because that all the playing is so flashy. You think, oh, those guys are the best. But then you learn, oh, well, anybody can do that. It's it's really something else. So then you kind of meander around. These days, I'm more like rock, rock and blues based stuff is where mm -hmm. I'm living. Do you sing too? If I need to. To me, that's the necessary evil. <laughs> the guitar playing is the fun part. So do you do you pick? I'm um, like kind of like pick the notes individually or do you strum or do you kind of do both oh i'll do both mm -hmm. yeah um it's it's kind of 
I go back and forth on that too. So I enjoy playing acoustic, both acoustic and electric guitar. So when I go to acoustic, it's more strummy or finger picking, maybe type like classical music type stuff or classical mm -hmm. guitar. Mm -hmm. But then I go into a different gear and I pick up an electric and I play just straight rock music. It's, I try to keep it varied. No, that's nice. My, uh, my, uh, my oldest son is a very good guitar player, um, in my opinion, anyway. He, um, and he enjoys it. He, he, he began playing guitar with his dad, who's kind of more of the heavy metal kind of, you know, strum like chords and make it loud and that kind of stuff. But Daniel became a very good guitar player. Um, it's, and it's, he's really good and he can pick and strum and sing and the, the whole things. He's really good. Cool. What type of music does he enjoy? Um, I would say kind of popular music, um, I think is, you know, songs that people know. And that he, you know, one of the ones he plays really well is um, Blackbird, um, which is a fun, nice okay. song. Yeah, no, and he's, he's very good. Music is a good hobby. I think so. Yep. It's all, it's, you can find something new every day with it. Never gets old. What's the latest song you've been playing on your guitar? Oh, uh, that's a hard question. I often don't What's play songs. What's the last songs. book you read? <laughs> I often don't play songs, actually. It's, it's more improvisation, just coming mm -hmm. up with uh, interesting guitar parts over things. Um, the last song I did learn, it was a Robin Trower song that I can't think of right now, but the artist is Robin Trower, so maybe that's mm -hmm. enough. So do you have um do you have a boy and a girl or two girls or two, two boys. boys or two, two boys. boys one one is a year and a half the other is three and a half one of the um sort of i would call it almost like communion things that um my oldest sons well all the children but especially the older son and his dad they would play they would every night right around like kind of as as he became more of a teenager they would that was their their fellowship. They would play music together and play it loud. And, and we got Daniel a set of pearls as well. So we had a drum set in the basement. Well, it was, yeah, it was kind of like where you are now. So I'm just letting you know, you should get your son a, a set of pearls because then he'll be able to accompany you on your guitar. And Well, in every Christmas, we got just another musical instrument. So we had like a set of pearls, you know, 17 guitars and, you know, just a ridiculous amount of keyboard you know we had the, the entire band in our in our basement by the time cool. he was um by the time he grew up yep oh i so, think he will like drums I, I do have a drum set in the garage and every time he goes out there he wants to beat on him oh and, gosh so how I, fun is I that i think he's gonna be a drummer and i think at one point we actually got daniel drum lessons too um which was good because he he um you know, just, just learning the rhythm part of it is sort of unlocks half of mu music, right? Because if, you know, part of it is the rhythm part and the other part is the, you know, the notes. And so he, he's, you know, if you can unlock either part of that, the rest of it is more easily decoded. Yeah. So Tony, you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, and we should be able to see your, our first slide. One of our um, panelists, one of our um, attendees asks, uh, is, uh, have you done much songwriting or original compositions, Tony? I just answered via text. Ah. Um, the answer was I've done little by myself, but I have done quite a bit with various bands and other people I've been associated with. Um, in fact, I've done a few, uh, in the last couple of years, I've done a lot of it virtually where they would send me a song and say, hey, I need a guitar part. So I would record it, send it back to them. Mm -hmm. And so that sort should... of thing is working out very nice with COVID. Good. We can see your screen. Okay. Except it's randomly, now I, we get to see a line going through the middle of the screen. Oh. First I saw part of the slide, then I saw the whole slide, then I just saw a line. Now I see just a line. Is that what you're seeing too, um, Bryant? Correct. I'm just seeing a line, but I did I did see the full screen there for for maybe five seconds. Try doing a stop share and start again. 
we can see your, your, well, no, we can't see your screen anymore. All right, now it looks good. All right, and just flash to the second slide and let's make sure that works. Good. All right, back to the first slide. Well, actually leave it there. That's a good place for people to see um, because if anybody's ever dropped, that's where to go to get onto Facebook Live if you can't log back into Zoom. Um, yeah, so, well, it's been a, a, a really, you know, it's really interesting times to be at the university. You know, there's a, a lot of um, creative energies going, you know, lots of people have been able to kind of do, you know, different kind of work than they are used to doing. So lots of our faculty members have been writing up papers and all of our modelers have been doing a lot of modeling, but the, you know, the, the people who are research experimentalists, they've, they've had a, they've had a kind of hiatus from doing a lot of their research, but at the same time, um, many of the faculty members were able to participate in COVID-19 focused research because that was considered an essential um, activity. And so the, those, those faculty members and researchers who had COVID related research were able to kind of keep, keep their research labs open with, with rules and restrictions. And now it's full on summer here in the, in the Keweenaw, just beautiful day, 79 degrees, blue, blue sky with a little bit of, I'll show you, I'm gonna turn you, show you my view out my window if I can show you my, turn this around. So this is what the day looks like in the Keweenaw. I got a view of the ski resort through the bush and um, just a beautiful day, optimum time of year. So, um, Tony, how many of your former students do you think you invited? Uh, if I'm going by a roster, it was a mass sort of blast to the, yeah. the last couple classes that I had in the spring. So it would have been maybe 150, 200. Holy cow. Well, if you're a former student of Tony, tell us that in the Q&A. <laughs> Just cause so that Tony will know who, who came. Actually, one is here who was not on that list, and he was the one asking the questions. Then, oh, there you go. That's Daniel. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Well, and, and um, we'll, we're going to do a poll question to find out kind of who's here. We haven't done that in a while, relative to because the audience is a mix of um, of uh, future students, current students, alumni, uh, faculty, and staff, and. Um, Tony's students are going to be, a, a, I think, a component this, this time. And then um, I, I put a category in here, none of the above. <laughs> so you can um, get, prepare yourself for that panel. Well, at 6.01, um, welcome everyone to Husky Bites. Uh, it is my pleasure to do this uh, Mondays in July, um, June. We're still in June. Um, uh, I've learned a lot already and I'm going to learn even more tonight with with Dr. Tony Pinar. Um, if you were to drop out, you can join us also on Facebook live live stream, which is um, the College of Engineering Michigan Tech's uh, Facebook page and you can go straight to that link. Or you can just jump back in the zoom meeting. Go ahead to the next slide, Tony, please. Um, and so this, um, if this evening's event has been sponsored by the uh, Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Glenn Archer. Uh, thank you so much, Glenn, for your sponsorship. And if, if anyone, as you're listening, are interested in sponsoring a future Husky Bites, um, please let me know. We are um, encouraging sponsorship because um, we have a lot of students in need for this fall because of the, of the pandemic. 100% um, of your donation will go to a student in need of support this fall. Uh, and so we are actively looking for sponsors and we encourage um, you guys to, to, to do that. I wanted to now introduce um, Dr. Tony Pinar, who is one of our faculty in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Michigan Tech. And he's gonna be speaking with us about how machines learn um, and a little bit of Tony's background and, and maybe you can add more to it. But Tony is, um, is, is one of our own. He earned his bachelor's degree here in electrical engineering, and then he couldn't get enough of that, and then he earned his master's degree here, and couldn't get enough of that, and then uh, got it piled higher and deeper uh, with a PhD um, earned in what year, Tony, was that? 
um, two or three years 17? ago. Okay, so, yeah, not very long ago. And uh, um, Tony's um, also active in research. Uh, and so um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. Thank you, and thank you to everybody that showed up to, I guess, all of these Husky Bites, especially this one titled How New Machines Learn. And so, as was mentioned, part of my interest here is in machine learning. And if that wasn't uh, appropriate or apparent from the title here, that's where we're going. So this talk is about machine learning. And I'll admit, I'm not really a machine learning researcher. I, I'm not working on these algorithms that push the envelope forward in the arena of machine learning. I'm simply a user. I use machine learning in some of my, uh, the research that I've done. And it's also happens to be a topic that a lot of people outside of academia, when you, when you bring up either artificial intelligence or machine learning, a lot of people kind of put up their guard. They really don't understand what it is. They think it's all over their heads. Uh, it's all black box magic. And so because of those two things, I thought it would be really good to give you an overview of what machine learning is to start and then go through some examples on how the learning is actually done with these algorithms. And then at the end, I'll show you some results from other research groups that have been able to fool these sorts of intelligent things. And well, before I move on, there is a note on the bottom. These slides will be made available to you sometime. I don't know when. I think they will be posted on Husky Link's site. Um, but when they are posted, if you are interested in this stuff, you'll see all, there's a lot of links throughout these slides. So everywhere that you see this bluish underlined text, um, I recommend clicking it, following the links, and learning some more if you want. So these are these are posted start, pretty quickly. Is, okay, very good. Uh, to start, so what is machine learning? So it is a subfield of artificial intelligence, and all AI is is a large collection of tools that allow you to simulate intelligence on a computer, to have it a computer make decisions as if it were a human. The small chunk of AI that is machine learning is a collection of algorithms or recipes that a computer can use that learns stuff from observations. So it'll learn various properties from observations. And usually with machine learning, the end goal is prediction. So you wanna learn something now so you can make a good prediction in the future. And a very toy example of that is shown on the bottom of the screen here. Let's say that we've got an autonomous robot that we want to travel from this point down to the checkered flag down there. All autonomous robots need to be able to sense their environment. This one is no different. And so we've equipped it with at least two sensors. One is a camera, so that can capture images of what the robot is seeing directly in front of it. And the other sensor is an accelerometer that can just capture movement data, essentially. And so this robot will deploy it in the field, pretend we haven't really told it much other than please go to the checkered flag. And so the robot traverses this path in, uh, throughout these rocks here down to the checkered flag. Now that it has done that, it has collected data or observations along the way. It's been taking pictures with the camera and it's been gathering this accelerometer data or in other words, the bumpiness data, the motion data. So when it gets there, it can maybe take a nap, put, press the pause button or something and do machine learning. So what does that mean? It can take all of that data that it captured, all of those observations. And after running machine learning algorithms on it, it's going to start to associate rocks or gravel with bumpiness, and it will start to associate grass with smoothness. And now that it's done this learning, when we deploy it again on the same mission or a similar mission, the hope is, it can predict a smoother path because it now can understand rocks and gravel are bumpy, grass is smooth. So it, we can use this to improve the, the terrain that the robot chooses to traverse. Now I hit a lot of stuff obviously, right? Like what happens when this machine learning happens? But this is the spirit of machine learning. It's taking observations, in this case from a camera and an accelerometer, and it's using those observations to learn something about its task. And then finally, after it learns, it can now predict uh, or, or it can do uh, its task better. And so now that you know what machine learning is, and I'm sure many of you have brought in uh, concept, uh, conceptions of it before you got here, this is a very popular question that always comes up uh, when we talk about machine learning. And it always comes up very quickly. 
doesn't matter what context, it's always one of the first questions that come up. So the question is, will AI and or machine learning take over the world? And I just want to gauge your thoughts about this. I'm not allowed to vote, but I would, I would vote they will take over the world any day now because I'm a Terminator fan. All right. I haven't watched them yet this summer again. It's like my summer go-to set of movies. It looks like you're in the minority so far. <laughs> I think so. So I don't know, can the audience see this? They can see the results live, yes. So we okay. see that 37% um, say no, 28% say there is only a small chance of it ever happening, and 31% say they may rule the world, but not anytime soon. And then a tiny fraction, only four people said they will take over the world any day now. <laughs> that's actually, that's good. I, a lot of times people come in uh, very aligned with Dr. Callahan. They think that ML or, ML or AI is going to take over the world. Um, I was actually surprised to see that a lot of people were saying no here. So that makes me feel a little better because I don't think it's going to happen any day soon. Let me, if I close this. Will that be detrimental to anything? I usually just minimize it or move it off screen. I just moved it, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we can't see it on your screen. Got it. We can only see it in our, our land. Okay, so we might return here soon. Hopefully I can remember the distribution of that. Um, it's about a third, a third, a third, and almost nothing about. All right. I'll remember it. So we'll come back to that, but for now, let's keep on going. So we're talking about machine learning, but within machine learning, there's a lot of different types of learning that goes on. This talk is all about what's known as supervised learning. So with supervised learning, you have uh, some expert, which might be you or it might be somebody else, you have an expert that is labeling the training data for the machine learning model. And so maybe we have a machine learning model that we wanna train to discriminate between dogs and cats. That means we have to generate a training data set that contains a whole lot of images of dogs and a whole lot of images of cats. And not only that, all of those image, images have to be labeled with their appropriate class. So all of the dog images have to be labeled as dog. All of the cat images have to be labeled as cat. That makes this a supervised learning problem. So we're telling the machine exactly what to look for, basically, in this case. Um, the third thing that I haven't talked about, we've talked about observations or training data, we've talked about this machine learning model, though we will talk more about that model very soon. We also have this thing called a cost function. It's called a function because it literally is a mathematical function, but it exists for us to tell the machine or for the machine to understand how it's doing. So as humans, we have a pretty intuitive sense on how we're doing on our tasks, that whatever the task may be but a machine doesn't have that sort of intuition. And so what this cost function does is it lets it evaluate itself to understand how good it is doing in the learning process. Anyway, long story short, everything that we talk about here is gonna be under the realm of supervised learning. I just wanted to point your attention to the fact that there's a lot of other learning methods out there under machine learning. And so now let's get to our example problem. So we all know that when we take our computer or uh, cell phone outside in the bright sun, it might be hard to see the screen. And typically the brighter it is outside, the brighter your screen has to be in order for you to see it. And so in this example problem, I wanna teach this laptop to adaptively brighten or dim its display with the ambient lighting. Now this isn't anything new. You probably have a laptop that will do this for you already. The caveat here is I want it to do it that is based on my preference. So I want it to mesh with my preference, not the engineer at the laptop factory. And so the first thing we're gonna to do to do this, spoiler alert, we're gonna use machine learning, right? So we first need training data. And what this means is I'm gonna maybe go on 50 different experiments. Each experiment is gonna give us a blue dot on the screen. And what an experiment is, is me measuring the ambient lighting conditions. So that's what the horizontal axis here. As you move to the right, the brighter it is outside. So I'm gonna record the ambient uh, light level. 
and then I'm going to record my preferred screen brightness. So that's what the vertical axis is showing. The higher you go, the brighter the screen gets. And so I did this maybe 50 times, and I plotted all of those data points, and I get what is shown in front of you. And just like our intuition tells us, if it's bright out, we need a very bright laptop screen. If it's not so bright out, we can turn the screen brightness down quite a bit. So now we have training data. But of course, we need a model. And so just looking at these data, it looks like a simple model will work. In fact, if you put these data in front of any human, I would argue that they would draw this straight line through it as I've gotten shown here. And so what I've shown is just a simple line highlighting the fact that these data can be described reasonably well with a very simple model or this single line model. Now to humans, this is obvious, but to a machine, which line is actually correct, right? It has no idea which one of these lines is the correct one to fit to the data. This is where that cost function comes in. So this cost function takes in our model, and remember our model in this case is just a straight line. It takes in the training data, and then it spits out two things for the machine. One, it tells the machine how well it's doing at that moment in time, and it also tells it how it can change the model to improve its fit to the data. It doesn't tell it exactly like where to put the model to make it the optimal model. It just basically says which direction we have to move that. And now when I'm saying model, I, I'm catching myself now saying model, model, model. I mean that line, right? So each one of the lines we have here is a model. How do we push them around so that they are optimal? That's how this cost function informs the machine. And so we have to define that cost function. And for this problem, what we're gonna do, and note that I zoomed in on some of the data points. So the blue data points here, we're just zoomed in on. Here is a particular model, straight line model. And for a single sample, I'm just gonna measure the distance from that sample to the straight line. And so for that one sample, the cost is the, the length of that dashed line that's shown on your screen. And we're gonna do that for all of the data points in our training data set. So we're gonna add up all of these to get our cost. And if that cost is a big number, that would mean that our model tends to be far away from the data. It means it's terrible, it's a bad model. If that number is small, it means that it tends to be very close to the data. And of course, that would be the model we're looking for. And now how does this work? Well, first of all, we just guess model parameters. What that means is we pick a random line Pick your orientation, slide it around in that picture wherever you want it, just pick a line. And then we can go into this loop right here. And when I say we, I should probably say the machine. We're gonna be checked out at this point. The machine's gonna go into this loop. It's gonna constantly evaluate its cost and then update that line in the direction of improvement over and over again. And it's gonna do so until that line is fit to our data. A picture of what's going on here, it played on your screen, I'll play it again. So this horizontal axis, it has the Greek letter theta, don't let that scare you. All that means is, uh, it is a particular slope of the line. So think of theta as tuning the orientation of our line model. And then what this is a plot of is the cost function. So the height of these dots from the, or the horizontal line here, the farther away they are or the higher they are, means a higher cost, it means a worse model. And so what happens, we pick a random line, maybe that means theta is right here. And then as we're in this loop, we can see that that dot starts to descend down this hill and it eventually settles where that line is minimum. Again, that is our cost. So what this algorithm is doing is it's finding the minimum cost to fit that line to these data. And after it converges and we have our model fit up the data appropriately, this is what we see. It looks very similar, if not the same as the line that I showed you when I first uh, presented this example, the one that a human drew, right? So we basically simulated intelligence using the machine. We've done what a human could do, although we had to do some tricks that I showed you in these previous slides to get there. But that's what we did. We learned this model based on these training data. And now what can we do with that? Well, now let's suppose I bring my laptop out and I see an ambient lighting condition that I've never seen before. So what this model will do is it will measure the ambient light right here. It'll look up on this line that it has learned where the appropriate operating point is, and it will set 
the brightness of the display to be at that particular brightness. And presumably because I've trained it using data collected by myself based on my preferences, this will be an appropriate brightness for this situation, again, based on my preferences. Just a few more details about what we just did. That strategy is known as linear regression, or at least three other names as shown here. It can be adapted to more complicated relationships, so it doesn't have to be just a straight line sort of thing as you see here. It could be something kind of squiggly, like you see on the top right of your screen. It can also be adapted to higher dimensions. So in this case, we only had one dimension. It was kind of a boring problem, but this can be adapted to any arbitrary number of dimensions. And then the last two bullets here kind of go together and they fall into a common misconception I'm starting to see. It's that, mach that misconception is that machine learning is totally new. It's cutting edge, it's bleeding edge. And while some of that is true for a lot of machine learning algorithms, uh, they're all developed using mathematics that was made hundreds of years ago. And so linear regression has its roots, roots in statistics. If you've ever taken a class uh, that has anything to do with curve fitting, this is sort of the same thing you might have seen there. And it was invented in the early 1800s, probably by Gauss, though there is some uh, controversy there. Um, sorry about that. So Gauss, what he was doing, he was looking at orbital trajectories of comets and planets. And so you might imagine in the 1800s, the telescopes they had probably weren't the best. So there was probably a little bit of error in his measurements. Plus he didn't have printers, like very super accurate printers or displays like this. So he was marking them down in his notebook. And so there's a little bit of error that might come into play there. And so after he did that over and over again for various comets and planets, he probably had a plot that looks something like this, where there's a lot of dots close together, but they're not on top of each other because every measurement has a little bit of error. But he was after understanding the trajectories of these objects or the orbital trajectories. And so what he did is instead of looking at a scatter plot of all the, these noisy data, he fit a line to it. So he could clearly see that the, or those orbital trajectories. Hmm. Anyway, it always blows my mind that some of this math that, that we feel is very new had, uh, in reality has been around a very long time. We have a comment. All right, uh, Gauss, so let's move ahead. Gauss was a husky? How cool. <laughs> yeah, I just found this randomly. Uh, he, he had that logo on there. That was amazing too. <laughs> Another misconception. <laughs> so linear regression is great. But like I mentioned, it forces us to choose a model. Like us as the machine learnest, we have to tell the machine which model to use. It'll do the fitting, it'll take care of that, but it doesn't know which model to use. And so we're gonna move to the other side of the spectrum. Linear regression is one of the simplest machine learning algorithms. We're now gonna jump to the other end, to one of the more complicated, because it doesn't make us choose this model. It is completely universal. It can re represent either one of these models as shown here, or literally any other model. Before we dive in, we do have to go back to biology class. And so here's a picture of a single neuron. On the left, we have what are known as dendrites, and they all have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not a biologist. If anybody here is a biologist, don't murder me. I'm gonna butcher this. I'm gonna call these signals. I hope that's okay, or maybe we can call them data coming in. So we have inputs coming to the left, call them X. They flow through the dendrites down to the cell body, and this nucleus sits there until the strength of all of those inputs is, is larger than some threshold. And once it exceeds that threshold, the output fires, and the output goes down the axons to one or more other neurons. So there's, there's many neurons connected over here. There's many neurons connected over here. And as you might imagine in your body, there's a whole lot of neurons connected everywhere. Now, moving to engineering, we don't like to look at those types of pictures. So this is how I view a neuron as an engineer. We still have inputs over here on the left. We still have an output over here. You can think of these arrows as the dendrites. Though there is one little bit that we put in here at, uh, in engineering, these W's, and those just mean weights. 
So every single signal or piece of data that comes into this is weighted. Or in other words, it's amplified or it's attenuated, if you want to think of it that way. So we can tune how much of those signals come into the cell body here. But again, this just waits. And once the, the strength of these inputs exceeds a certain level, it fires an output to whatever's connected out here. And now, how do we go about training these? So this, uh, this artificial neuron, this is a model, a machine learning model. So it shouldn't be surprising that we can train it to do things. Well, the training is the same spirit as we've already seen. We need training data. We need a cost function, same as that for linear regression. We would feed it the training data. We would let it evaluate itself with the cost function. It would uh, update itself, meaning it, it would update its dendrite weights here in the direction of better performance or of improvement. It would reevaluate using the cost function, etc. It'd go through that same loop. And at the end, we would have these five weights tuned to whatever our training data are. It would be fit to our training data. So that's great. One problem, a single neuron is very boring. It happens to be as good as a straight line. And so we could have used a single artificial neuron to tackle our laptop brightness example. However, if the data look like this as shown on the right, we could not use a single neuron to do that. So what do we do? But before we do that, I wanna ask you this. How many neurons are in your brain? And actually, I think mm -hmm. I found out just before this webinar started, it might not be your brain, it's your body. Well, let's pretend they're the same. So how many neurons are in your body? So the choices are 250,000, 760 million, 2.3 billion, 86 billion, 250 billion. So my critical skills are telling me it's going to be in the billions because you have three of them that are in the billions. You might be on the right track. I'm going to go with 86 billion. And the answers are coming in. It looks like nobody thinks that it, people agree with me it has to be in the billions and um it looks like that the t it's a tie for the top two highest at 86 billion and then 250 billion with about 37 percent each and a uh, some of them a so fewer fewer number of people believe that there's 2.3 billion at 24 percent all so right the answer what's the answer the answer is d 86 billion so actually all the numbers that were here are numbers pulled from other animals. Mm. 250,000, those that's kind of the order of the ant or the fruit fly, all the way up to 250 billion up to the elephant. And so obviously the number of neurons does, doesn't seem to correlate with intelligence level uh, totally. That would suggest that elephants are smarter than humans. Maybe they are, I don't know. Um, but just take it with a grain of salt. If you click this link right here, you'll learn a whole lot more about this than I can give you. And so we've, we've shown that only one neuron can only do simple things. We know as humans that if we take multiple neurons and connect them together, we can do very interesting things. And so why not take these artificial neurons and connect them into larger networks? And so that's the idea here. We simply can build a network of neurons to increase the model complexity. And in this image, what you're seeing is a collection of neurons. Every ball that you see, red, blue, or green, is a neuron. And every green arrow that you see, those are the dendrite weights. So with that single neuron that we had a few slides back, we only had five weights to learn. In this case, I didn't count them, but there might be 20 or so weights to learn. So the number of weights in your network kind of gives you an idea of how complex of a model it can represent. And we don't have to stop there. We can add even more neurons to really increase the model complexity. So now in this picture, all of the black dots you see are individual neurons. All of the lines are the weights. And obviously now when we, have to, or when we go to train, we have to learn hundreds or, or maybe in, on the order of a thousand weights for this one. Well, what can we do if we do that? Well, we can do a whole lot of interesting things. Only one I'm really going to dive into here. It turns out you can train an artificial neural network to recognize faces. And that means you could either train it to recognize a face against an elephant or some other animal, or you can train it to identify certain people within a group of, of other humans. But what's interesting 
is how it actually learns. And that's kind of what I wanted to show you using this slide. So here is just an example of a larger artificial neural network. And in this case, it looks like we kind of have layers, right? There's very clear vertical layers here. The, the data or the images are gonna come in on the left-hand side and then it's gonna get propagated through left to right until we reach our output. And that's where our decision, our decision will come from, is the output. But how does the data get processed as it progresses through here? That's what's shown in these images on the top. In the first hidden layer, all of these neurons uh, in that layer are learning to identify very low level detail. And what I mean by that is basically edges. So I know it's probably not clear looking at these, but what you're seeing in this left pane those are all uh, edge detecting filters. And so for example, the one that I'm circling with my red dot, I hope you can see that, mm -hmm. it's got like black and white stripes and they're at, kind of at a slant like that. So what that means is wherever we have a, an edge in an image with that slope, that neuron is gonna fire. And the same thing is true for all of these other ones, but they have different scales. They have different orientations, different scales. The bottom line is this first layer learns to identify super low level detail, meaning edges. Now the outputs of these neurons are given to the next layer. And remember, those neurons fire when they detect edges. So this hidden layer number two knows when those earlier neurons have seen edges. But they don't look at edges. They look at kind of the next step up in complexity. So the neuron that this is plotting right here waits until it receives edge information that resembles a nose. Or think of a collection of edges that resembles a nose. So if it sees that, it's gonna fire and its output will move further down the chain. This neuron over here waits until it gets a collection of edges that looks a lot like a human eye. And when it sees that collection of edges, it fires its output to the next layer. And so what hidden layer number two is doing is it's taking all of those edges that we have and it's assembling them into facial features. Now we get to hidden layer number three. These neurons take facial features like noses, eyes, and mouths, and they put it all together. So now we have neurons that are actually taking facial features and firing when those features look like a human face. And these are all different. So every neuron learns something a little bit different in here. Uh, but just looking at these, it's very clear. It's, it's without a doubt, we have a network that is looking for faces. And so to me, it's kind of interesting that this learns a hierarchical pattern, right? We have this, this artificial neural network, early layers learn super low level detail, details that us as humans don't care about. When I look at somebody's face, I don't go, oh, look at all those edges, lots of different orientation, right? <laughs> we don't do that. This learns it in a hierarchical fashion, edges, facial features, and then finally faces. And not only can they recognize faces, they can even generate faces. And so you can go to the website that's on the top of your screen to see a fresh image that has been generated uh, at your request of a human that has never lived before, has never existed. It's simply taking all of the training data, so all of the images that we fed the neural network to do its training, and it's kind of mixing and matching, coming up with new things. Now. There are nine images on the screen. I want you to take a look and see if you can find any faces that are clearly fake. Oh, we got a poll going. Which face is clearly fake? And the choices are A through H. Oh, well. I is no choice. It must have been to me. All right, and so interesting. There's kind of a mix across the board. Um, the um, 13, nope, it, nope, it's drop, A is dropping. Oh, people are changing their answers, I think. So right now, at this moment in time, 13% of the people think A is fake, 8% B, 7% C, 10% D, 9% E, 3% F. Um, 2% G and 9% H. Hmm. 
If you scroll down, um, I has 38%. Oh, that's the one I can't see. It's behind my screen. Oh, yeah, I can see why that one's. Yep, I agree with that. Are there more than one correct choices? There are more than one, and there may be more than I identified. So maybe somebody in the audience is looking closer than I did to find these. I'm interested to see. What's the answer, Tony? What's the answer? Are we ready? Yeah, I think so. 40% think I. 40% are correct, as well as the 7% that selected C. So I is pretty obvious, I think. Over here, we see some glasses, but as we cross the bridge of the nose, they kind of disappear, so there's no lens over here. And then in the picture C, the glasses are, again, a giveaway. The frame of these glasses goes over her hair here, but under there, and I don't see an earpiece. So I think C and I are both very clearly fake, though maybe there's some others. D had 11% and A had 12%. Can somebody uh, type, somebody who answered yeah. D, type in why they think D is fake? I'd be curious about that. Doesn't have enough eyebrows. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, we can wait for those to come in, but I'll, I'll move on. Yep. And I'll keep an eye here. And so neural networks, they can do a whole lot of interesting stuff. Recognizing faces is just one small piece of the pie. They can do uh, the handful of things that I have on the screen here, these are just fun applications I thought you might be interested in, but this is the tip of the iceberg. Artificial neural networks have become extremely popular. A whole new field has popped up around them known as deep learning, and I really don't see them going away anytime soon. And now that you know how they're trained and what they can do, or at least some of what they can do, I want you to ask yourself, how intelligent are these networks really? And so I have three examples here, and they're interesting in that it's, it's kind of a trivial way to fool something, but it's highly effective. And so what does that mean? Let's just take a look. So on the top right, we have an image of a panda. To you and me, this is so clearly a panda, right? We know that's a panda, 100% confident. If we give it to an, a neural network that has been trained with image classification, it also says panda, but only with a 57% confidence level. And okay, it's still got the correct answer, bit better than 50%. So let's just give that to the network. But let's take this same image and add a little bit of noise. So think of the snow that you would see on your TV if your antenna isn't coming in like 20 years ago. I don't think, I don't know if TVs do that anymore. <laughs> so think of that type of noise, but then add red, blue, and green color to it. So you get something like this. And if you add that noise directly on top of that panda image, remember it's just a little bit of noise. Here is what results. We can't even tell we changed the image, right? This mm -hmm. is still so clearly a panda. But we give this corrupted, noise corrupted image to that same network. And it now classifies this as a gibbon, which is a type of monkey. And its mm -hmm. confidence is almost 100%. It's 99% confident that that is a monkey. That's crazy. I don't know. Some other examples, there's one down here. So this picture of a stop sign was fed to a neural net that was trained to identify traffic signs. Well, the researchers in this case put four pieces of tape on the stop sign, two white and two black pieces. They fed this image to the neural network and it says, I think it's 45 miles an hour. Um, and so if you were lit riding in this vehicle, in this autonomous vehicle with this technology, you would go past this stop sign at 45 miles an hour, which is ridiculous because to humans, that is still so clearly a stop sign. And now finally, similar sort of example, this research group 3D printed a special turtle. So I'll play the video in a second. This is a special turtle. And it's special because when we take a neural network, a very good neural network, and use it to classify what that turtle is, it thinks that it's a rifle, and it is very confident that it is a rifle. So what you're gonna see in this video, uh, they're, they're gonna move the turtle around and turn it, which is also impressive, which means this neural net classifies this turtle as a rifle, even if we turn it a little bit. And over on the right, this is the output from the network. So the height of these bars is the, the network's confidence, and then the label down here is what it thinks it is. So immediately when they push the turtle in, 
it thinks it's a rifle, it's very confident it's a rifle, and it still continues to think it's a rifle, even though the camera is moving and the turtle is moving. And I think they even, even put a second. Like a rifle. No, it, it does not look like a rifle one bit. And so all three of these examples, these were, these were applied to very powerful neural networks, like cutting edge neural networks, and they're able to fool them with these relatively simple mechanisms. So that's kind of the question I wanted to ask here is how intelligent are these neural networks? And then with that, I was going to bring this question back mm -hmm. to see if I changed anybody's minds or shifted the distribution. All right, let's see. I wrote down the answers from before. So we, um, we'll see if anybody shifted. All right, it's results are coming in and uh, Coming in quickly, looks like the most popular feature is still a no with 40% and, and then 27% feel that there's only a small chance of it ever happening. 32% say they may rule the world, but not anytime soon. And so, Tony, they didn't budge much. A 4% shifted to up into the no, they won't ever. Okay, that's they enough. Shifted a little I'm bit up, up, uphill there. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I didn't shift it the other way. Maybe I'll, that'll be my victory. I'm glad I didn't shift it the other way. I really think you're all kind of onto it. I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. Um, in fact, I, the, the biggest risk to me, I think, is just bad humans using this technology for bad things. It's not mm -hmm. so much the technology, it's who is using it. Good point, good and point. And so that's it. All right, so um, we're going to take a pause for a second, and I want to thank um, all of our attendees for being here. Brian, I'd be interested in if you can pull up that first poll that I forgot to give. I'm, I'm curious to know um, who is in our audience, so you can fill that out while I uh, also brief next week's um, Husky Bite. So first of all, thank you, Glenn Archer, Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering, for sponsoring um, uh, and supporting student scholarships. We do need a sponsor for next week, um, and so the email to contact us up there, it's Bryant Weathers, who is also our um, host or, and co-host um, in helping with the technology. Um, so next week, we're shifting our emphasis to civil and environmental engineering, and we are, um, he's good, we're going to be learning about how water gets, um, becomes uh, drinkable. Uh, oh, we have a sponsor. That's Noah Munt. That's right. I forgot about that. So I think it's the week after we don't have a sponsor. Um, and so thank you so much in advance, Noah, for sponsoring it. And so relative to who is joining us here today, 13% of us are future students, 13% are current students, 3% are friends in Michigan Tech, 12% uh, are Michigan Tech faculty and staff, 6% are family of current or future students, 6% are friends of friends, and 49% are alumni. And so thank you, Husky community, for coming together. Again, this is so much fun, I've actually, um, for the world's biggest introvert, I've been having so much fun connecting with you um, through this through this medium. Um, all right, so type your Q and A answers in. We've already got a couple people who have who have asked questions. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so, on your um, Zoom place, if you if you scroll your 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 cursor down to the lower edge of it, um, there's a place where there where it says Q&A and you can type in a Q&A after you click on it you can type in a Q&A and so um, uh, an anonymous attendee asks um, I know you said you're not a machine learning researcher but there is a lot of discussion especially with facial recognition regarding bias in algorithms or there are some funny videos that illuminate how difficult it is for Siri or Alexa to recognize accented English all this to say do you know much about the work that's being done to make strides in the sort of inclusive side of this technology? Uh, no, but I can talk a little bit. Um, so I don't know of any funny videos about Siri or Alexa recognizing accent, accent in English. Though you are right, there is a bias in our algorithms. Um, but I should say it's not the algorithm or how, how should I put it? The algorithm itself is not biased. It is how we train the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So biasing comes in after the algorithm is trained. 
And remember what we need for training. We need training data. So this means that if we have a biased model, that bias was existent in that training data. And that's where the problem is. A lot of the data that we've been collecting over the past decades has been filtered through humans, basically, right? We, we think this is the demographic we want to gather this data from. Uh, these are the things we want to look at, etc. So it's always filtered through humans. So that training data just inherently has our, our own biases in them. And that's obviously going to be pushed into the machine learning model. How do you make it more inclusive? I don't know. I mean, you have to, you have to get varied training data. It, it, it means we have to go back to the drawing board when we're collecting that data. Is, is there work being done on that front? I don't know. I'm sure there is. But there I mean, is. There is. Yeah. Um, and Michigan Tech actually had a speaker in about this. And it's, it's, um, I think one of the faculty we're hiring is actually doing research in this area for one of our new faculty, um, okay. I believe. All right, and so Kay asks, um, uh, well, mentions that we, sh we need another option. They will take over the world and things will be so much worse than we can predict. <laughs> it can't be much worse than it is now. We're in a pandemic. Well, I better, I better take that back. I take that back. Knock on wood. <laughs> um, all right. Maybe that Walter. should be an option, but maybe that's far in the future. Too far in the future. We don't want to think about that right now. Yeah, I, can't, I don't want to think about a worse world. Walter asks, can you give me your opinion on autonomous driving? It sure seems any turtle on the road would be in trouble. <laughs> um, well, okay. So, so the turtle example that I showed you, that was, a, that was a highly fabricated turtle. That was a very special turtle that, that fooled that machine. Uh, but there are real concerns, especially with autonomous driving and this technology. I, I think, I, I don't remember when, in the last couple of years, there have been experiments where you're able to fool an autonomous car either with a piece of tape on a road or a laser pointer. I can't remember. But think about placing just some benign tape, like pieces of white tape along the side of the road. I don't, I'm not sure the configuration they had, but that was enough to fool their neural net that was driving the car. So yes, there are tremendous issues that could pop up because of this. The good news is people are working on uh, uh, I guess, anti-adversarial uh, agents. That, that's part of the reason um, I, I wanted to show you these because while, yeah, you, they are easy to fool, the reason the people are working on the, this research, it's not to fool the machines. It's to learn how they're being fooled and how can we make them stronger so that it's harder to fool them. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question or the question? Hope I think so. so. Well, and Pamela, um, notes uh, uh, and says, thank you, um, Tony. This was my first Husky Byte and I really enjoyed it. I work in engineering learning and development at Ford and AI and machine learning are relevant topics for our engineering community. And so I, I wanna mention, um, we have just developed in the College of Engineering 18 different online graduate certificates, um, about five of which are in mechanical engineering and about five are in electrical engineering, if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, and they will be available, um, assuming that they are approved by Senate in, within the next month, it, they will be available start, starting this fall. Regardless, those online courses will be available this, this fall. And so if you're interested in um, learning, um, start looking for our online courses because the, these are, and what a certificate is, is a, is a stack of three courses together around a theme. And so one of the themes could be, for example, machine learning. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not, don't quote me, I'm not sure that's one of our certificates suite. with so many, I can't remember the names of any of them, but I'll try to remember to bring a list of those next week to Husky Bytes so, so I can mention them to you. All right, our next question is from Robert. When training, do some techniques include a something else category to try to get away from the failures you mentioned? Um, yes, there are, there are little I don't know if you want to think of, of, of linear regression as kind of a, the center of a cluster and then surrounded by a whole lot of other stuff. All that other stuff is, is techniques that can help with that sort of stuff or with those failures that I mentioned. Um, one very common issue is known as overfitting. And mm -hmm. so 
let me go back. So this is good. So in this example, we had a lot of training data. It was kind of scattered around and we fit a straight line to it. And in this case, that was appropriate. But in some cases, maybe you want, even though you have data like this, you want to use a more complicated model. And we can actually, it's, it's quite easy to find a more complicated model that can pass through every single point you see on your screen. It's going to be some crazy wiggly line, mm -hmm. but I can find a mathematical function that'll do that for you. That is actually not a great thing. It's known as overfitting in machine learning. In other words, your machine learning model is basically memorizing your training data where in for any other input, it's going to do really terribly. And so I wish I could draw on the screen. I really can't. I don't even have any paper, but imagine. So just a wiggly line that passes through each one of these data points, but in between the data points, maybe, maybe it swings up really high, like right here. And it comes back down for that data point. It goes way down here. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, and I've been meaning and so to ask you, how did you get your cursor to do that? To be a red dot with a tail. How did you get your cursor to do that? You have to share that tip for us. <laughs> can, can you see the bottom uh -huh. left? Yeah. You just turn on the pointer. Oh, for goodness sake. All right. So that's what you do. So anyway, we can, we can specify a really complex model that where that line is wiggling all over. And when we encounter ambient lighting conditions that are exactly what we encountered in training, it will do just fine. But when we encounter an ambient lighting scenario, maybe like right here, where we don't have any training data in that area, our model will very likely be way up here. It wouldn't make any sense. And so that's, uh, to me, that always kind of relates to human learning. Like when humans learn, memorization is not the way to do it. If you memorize what, yeah. what you think you should learn, when you get to the test, you're probably going to find you missed something. That's not how you want to learn. And that's not how you want to learn in this case either. You want kind of a, a smooth line that represents the data. You don't want it to exactly fit. So I know that was a long winded question uh, and it only talked about one other technique, but that's, they, they're out there. Those sorts of techniques to get out of these pitfalls do exist. Well, the next question's from my, my good friend, Dave, um, who asks, if AI is not that good, how is Google making so much money predicting which ads will create the most sales? I think it's probably good. <laughs> I, I think they're, they're doing uh, a good job in that domain. So what they're doing, they're learning models of you. If you're using Facebook or Amazon or, or Google or anything, when they're training these models, their model is a model of yourself. And so, like I mentioned early on, kind of one of the, the, the things with machine learning, you're learning a model to do better prediction in the future. So when they develop the models of you, they can predict what you might want to buy next. And so if they give you a link to that item and they're right, they make some money, right? If they don't get it right, well, better luck next time. But that's what they're doing. I don't know how to fool those ones yet, though. I don't have any examples of fooling uh, Amazon's or Google's AI bots. <laughs> Nather asks, what is the difference between deep learning and regular neural networks? Um, not much. It's oh, my, guard, my guard dog. So, the image that you see here is technically uh, a, what would I call it? It would be called a, a, an artificial neural network with a single hidden layer. So this is really, this is really where artificial neural networks start and stop in terms of that word, neural networks. So the field of neural networks, it started with very small networks like this. In fact, you might think artificial neural networks are cutting edge. They're not. The artificial neuron was invented in the 50s. People knew that you could connect them to create more complexity like you see here on this slide. The problem is we didn't have computers that could do the learning. There are a lot of numbers or a lot of weights in this image that we have to learn. That was too complex of a task for old computers. And so while they knew they existed, it wasn't really tractable or, or practical to do. And so research kind of stuck with these neural networks like you see on this 
Now moving to deep networks. A deep network is a neural network with more than three layers. So what you see on this screen, this would qualify as a deep network. What you see on this screen, this would qualify again as a deep network. So when people talk about deep learning, what they're really meaning is just neural networks with a lot of neurons, a lot of layers in them. So Tony, I've, I've actually learned so much tonight, I can't even tell you. Um, we will keep answering questions until questions are done, but I know some audience people might need to leave. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I can see that we have a ton of un unanswered questions. Oh, oh, we have 10 open, open questions. So we're gonna keep answering questions. Um, George Ann asks, how do you see quantum computers affecting the results? Thanks, George Ann. I have no idea. I don't know much about quantum computers. Um, if I had to guess, I would suspect that they would make the training process almost instantaneous. And so one thing I didn't talk about is the, is the actual computation part of the training. So we give this, in this network on the screen, we give this a bunch of training images, we give it labels, and then it goes into that cycle of evaluating how good it is moving its weights in the direction of improvement. That might take a long time for a complex task like this on a, a regular desktop computer, that might take weeks. Um, if we had quantum computers, maybe we could shave that down into seconds or even less. But again, I don't know anything about quantum computing. I'm just wildly speculating. Uh, what could go wrong speculating on the internet? <laughs> and remember, we're recording this forever, and so it's gonna be posted. Yeah. You know, people will be quoting you in, you know, fake, fake news or whatever. Right. Um, Eric asks, does the layout connection of the, of the neurons change or only do the weights change? This is a great question. For example, does the style of the network get created by the algorithm or is it human created? So the, the layout or the architecture is defined, <laughs> is typically defined by a human. So uh, the, the human would define what this thing looks like. And then after it goes into training, it's kind of set. At that point, the architecture is set, only the weights are adjusted. But there are other techniques out there where these networks are built as part of an AI process. And so in that case, the human is out of the loop and they'll adaptively build the network until it, it is what it needs to be for the task. So it's kind of uh, a both. I guess. Okay. William asks, could you please talk about Internet of Things and machine learning? How do they interact? Oh, good question. So the Internet of Things is just this concept that as computers get smaller and smaller, even down to the or, or chip sizes get smaller, we can start putting little tiny computers in basically everything everything around us. So in your light switch, maybe even in your light bulbs, they can communicate together. Um, maybe you have the chip in your refrigerator and your toaster, just everything has one of these chips that can talk to the internet. So that's the internet of things. And if you think about that, if we start putting that sort of, uh, or that sort of computation and, and sensors on all of these different devices, they're co constantly grabbing data. Right? Machine learning and AI is all data driven. We need to train these algorithms using vast amounts of data. So the, the Internet of Things might actually be a good thing in that regard. Right? They're increasing the amount of data that's, that's uh, available to us. Now, the downside to that same thing is that now we've got all this data. We cannot sit down and sift through this data as humans and find these patterns. We need help. We need machines to understand how to do this. And that is what machine learning and data science as in general is all about. That's as much as I can talk about the relationship between the two. I've never done any IoT projects that involve machine learning, though they are out there. That's all I can tell you at this point. RGD um, asks, what do you think are the challenges to improve the neural network? Oh, hmm. training seems to be an issue currently because it takes so long to train these networks. Um, so I think there should be some, 
or there, there's got to be some strides taken in terms of the training process to accelerate it. And then another part of it is neural networks are kind of black boxes. Like we, we really don't know what's going on the inside. We can't explain their decisions very well. And that might be a problem, right? What if we need to know why that decision was chosen? It becomes kind of a, an ethical sort of dilemma. Um, so in my opinion, those two things are the shortcomings uh, of neural nets, though I expect both of those are going to be tackled and overcome in the near future. A second question from Dave, um, our, um, my friend Dave, is the book The Age of Surveillance Capitalism claims that AI is already having a huge impact on our lives today. Do you disagree? I do not disagree. I think it does have a huge uh, impact on all of us. Um, maybe one example is, so, so in machine learning, there are, there are models that we like to call recommender systems. These are systems that try to learn a model of you to provide you suggestions of what you might like. So if you've mm -hmm. ever shopped at Amazon, you've seen this. Um, if, you've, if you've been on Facebook, I think Facebook might say, you might know these people. That's sort of a recommender system. If you watch Netflix, right, they're always throwing stuff in your face. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. Please watch this. I think those, um, they're really, they're pushing us around, I'm not in a, in a bad way, but oftentimes we'll just fire up Netflix and see what it presents us. And we'll choose, you know, something in the top three or something. And so maybe they can steer us down a path we might not want to go, right? Obviously watching one video isn't going to be a, a terribly bad path, but think of the accumulation. You mm -hmm. do that over and over again. Now you're letting that recommender system think for you. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's such a great thing. That's a good point. All right, Daniel asks, speaking of training data, if you spend enough time on this person does not exist, you can get some very interesting results when more than one face is produced in one image. One of the people may be relatively normal looking while the other is monstrous and disfigured. Is there a difference in impact between more robust training data and stronger, more complex neural networks? What are the pros and cons? Hmm. Thanks for the question, Dan. Um, <laughs> is he one of your I former students? I don't think I have a good answer. Yes, he is. Uh, is there a difference in the impact between more robust training data and stronger, more complex neural nets? So I will say the more complex you make your neural net, the more training data you need to, to do the training. Um, just as kind of a, a interesting thought, our example here, I did 50 experiments. Each experiment yielded two numbers, right? The ambient brightness, and my desired screen brightness. And so that was 100 different numbers, right? The, the blue dots here, those are re represented by 100 different numbers. We can represent a straight line with only two numbers. If you remember back to maybe some high school math, you can represent it with a number that means the slope, how quickly the line climbs. And the other number is called the intercept. It's kind of sliding it up and down. Y so equals mx plus b. You got it. And so really what's going on is we give this machine some data, a hundred different numbers, and it goes into this machine learning process. But think of it as like boiling down some vegetable broth. It takes that data and it renders it down to its essential bits. And those essential bits are the two numbers, the slope and the intercept that define that line. So what machine learning is all about is taking information that's in training data and encoding it into, in this case, a model. And so for a straight line, we really only need two data points to define that straight line, right? I can pick one up here, one down there, we connect the two, we get a straight line model. Now go back to a neural network like this. Now this has uh, hundreds, thousands, it could be millions of different weights that we have to learn. Think of the amount of data that we would have to have to distill it down to a million different numbers. You need a lot of images to do that. 
And that also happens to be another kind of downside to, to artificial neural networks. If you want to train a very large network, it's going to take a long time, but you also better have enough training data for the problem that you're trying to attack. Well, if you so think Dan, I don't think I've answered you. I've, I've kind of skated around your question. That's the best I could do. If you think about how long it takes a child, a baby to learn to talk, right? Right, they have a lot more weights than even the simplest machine learning models, right? Yeah, yeah. Interesting, all right, let's see. From Zijan, he says, uh, hi, Tony, I took your machine learning class last year. I learned a lot from it. Would you like to share some interesting applications of machine learning with us? I can't think of any off the top of my head that are not on this slide because I just made this slide. And so these are all fresh um, in mind. So I would encourage you once these this, the link to these slides is posted to go down the rabbit hole on these links. Um, I'm trying to think of some that exist that are not here. Well, that's good. That's good. You've got some examples for us. And so all of these, um, the video and the slides are posted on the Husky Bytes website, and that's where you can get to these. And they're posted as PowerPoints, so you can download them and you can click on the links. I believe that's how we're posting them. All right, we've got four open questions. Um, one from the Geigers. Does machine learning attempt to distinguish between outliers and purely erroneous data? Um, not, not by default, though there are methods that can be employed to, to make that distinction. Okay. Is that enough detail for you? I don't know if I can give much more on that one. These are too hard. This is, I'd tell no, my students it's good. We're, we're, we're imagining, we're taking you as a machine learning expert. Um, um, so Alexander asks or states, if this is all old news, what's the cutting edge on machine learning now? It is really all about um, deep learning. So deep learning, as I mentioned, is, is this fairly new field that's built around neural networks. And it's all about networks that are very large. Uh, so it's this, that literally is a, a, the cutting edge field under machine learning at this point. Though there are, I don't even want to guess the number, there are 50, 50 plus other al machine learning algorithms that exist. And for any one of those other algorithms, you can find the state of the art. They're not just, they're not dead, they're not stagnated, they're always evolving. So you can look at any one of the other machine learning algorithms out there, and there's gonna be some new bits that have just been developed for that. Very good. Um, uh, Liz um, asks, what would you say to the attendees who are future Huskies who might be interested in studying or doing research in machine learning? Are there any classes or skills or ways of thinking that they might even be doing in high school or that they could take when they get here? So really the driving force behind machine learning is mathematics. Uh, so I would say take all the math that you can. Um, that might be painful to hear for some of you, but take all the math you can. And then, of course, the way that we do this stuff is by programming computers. So another thing that you might want to do is look at just basic programming courses, um, of which there are many both on campus and even on the internet. There are those MOOC or massive online open mm -hmm. courses that you can find that can help along that front. And furthermore, there's even machine learning classes also that you can find online that are not so much um, meant for true machine learners. They're kind of entry level courses, so they don't go through a lot of the math, but those might be good for you to scope out as well. Well, and um, I don't know why that made me want to mention, but we have a, um, a new approved degree program in the College of Engineering residing in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, which is robotics engineering. And I imagine that um, there's, a, there's an intersection between this field and, and robotics. For sure. So now that you mentioned that, um, I'll also spill the beans that we are currently trying to develop some, like we're calling them modules. These are just basically think of one or two lectures on a topic and an assignment. 
we're trying to develop these modules that we can insert into some of those robotics engineering classes so that I think it's as, as early as your second semester, you're starting to be exposed to different AI and machine learning concepts. And those modules will continue from semester two all the way through your senior design experience. And that's not only robotics engineering. Uh, robotics engineering shares a lot of courses with electrical and computer engineering. There's a little bit of overlap there. And so whether you pick robotics or electrical or computer engineering, there's a good chance you're going to see some of this in your undergraduate classes. Yep, we keep you guys hopping, that's for sure. Um, while we are mentioning that, um, well, we have one last question, and then I wanted to, I have to remember to mention tips and tricks from three chairs and a dean, which is our July Tuesday webinar series for future students and high school students, and even down to seventh, eighth grade, but, but I think high school. So I will try to remember to mention that to you. The last question is from Nicole, and, um, and the question is, does Alexa actually learn you? I don't know what you mean by learn you. I would suspect all Alexa does is, I'm trying to think, can somebody else's voice trigger your Alexa? Yeah, right? I can trigger somebody else's Alexa. So what I think is, it's just simply a voice recognition software. So if you want to think about it, Alexa is kind of the interface between you and Amazon. And so when you speak <laughs> or anybody speaks, Amazon, or I'm sorry, Alexa is just listening to the audio and it's decoding what you want. After it understands what you want, then it sends that data to Amazon. And Amazon, they are learning you. They want to know what you, what your interests are, what you like to buy, right? And so I don't think Alexa is really learning you, but it's a piece of the puzzle uh, that certainly is learning you. So do you have, um, I want you guys to see Abby. Abby was my, oh, my big guard dog. Say hello, Abby. <laughs> She's taking care of me. Do you have Alexa? Tony? I do not have Alexa. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I do either, but every now and then my computer will, will, will think I'm, asking it something and it will talk to me. Uh -huh. I don't think it's Alexa. All right, uh, do we have a last slide to project to remind people about who's speaking next time, Bryant? Or, or Tony, you might have access to that. So thank you again, everyone. Our next speaker is um, Daisuke Minakata. Um, he is in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Please feel free to invite friends to this or to forward the links. And then um, tips and tricks from three chairs and, and, and a dean is going to be our July Tuesday webinar series. And that's focused on, on kind of like college readiness or difficult course readiness. We're going to be focusing on sharing um, literally tips and tricks on um, solving, pro solving technical problems. So by technical problems, I mean things with units where it's like how many atoms are in you know, 10 grams of copper where, you know, and, or how, you know, what is the velocity of, um, you know, you know, this physics problem. Uh, and so I'll be starting leading off. Um, so I'm the Dean giving tips and tricks, but, um, and then uh, the other chairs are the chair of, of, of electrical and computer engineering. Glenn Archer will give a, one of the, one of the webinars. Um, the chair of civil, Audra Morris will give one, one of the webinars and um, the chair of GMES, which is Geological and Mining Engineering and Sciences, John Gerke will give the, um, one of the webinars too. And, and we think, well, and again, they're gonna be 20 minutes with Q&A. We don't think the Q&A will go too long, um, but um, you guys might, might enjoy us. And alumni are welcome to join us too. If you wanna brush up on your dimensional analysis, we, you are welcome. Thank you, Tony. I learned a lot. I, I actually feel like I have a layman's under, ability to talk about machine learning now. Uh, and uh, it was really, you're an outstanding teacher. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you to everybody for joining. Yeah, I know. And thanks, um, Bryant and Sue and Kim for the backup team. George Ann says, thank you, Tony. And um, Nicole says, no Alexa, but many friends have Alexa. So, all right, everyone, you take care. It's been awesome hanging out with you again. And until next week, bye. See ya.